this is Adam Eliyahu Berkowitz from Israel 365 News. I'm here with a dear friend, an amazing scholar, Rabbi Pesach Holiki, and we're here to discuss what I think is a hugely neglected yet explosive topic. We're going to be discussing the rabbinic perspectives on whether or not Christianity is idolatry. Um, and this is going to be done from a Jewish perspective. Uh, using the rabbinic halachic Jewish sources. So Rabbi Wilicki, before we jump in, I want to point out that I spent a lot of years learning in yeshiva. We never, ever, ever even came close to discussing this question. I've been on a lot of um, forums that might be considered interfaith connecting Christians and Jews, and this subject has never been discussed. Why do you think this has never been discussed? Well, I, I think it's never discussed or it's avoided in the context of the Jewish Christian relationship because we're afraid of opening up subjects that will offend our counterparts. So I'll give you, you know, the analog on the other side. Even if you asked the most you know, the, the most ardent supporter of Israel who holds to any kind of normal Christian theology. If you were to ask them, do you love the Jewish people? Do you love the state of Israel? And let's say they say yes. And if you said to them, okay, if a Jew doesn't accept Jesus, doesn't believe in Jesus, are they going to hell or are they going to heaven? Now, what often would happen in that situation is they would start to squirm. And the reason they'd start to squirm is the same as the reason why people like yourself and myself, uh, Jews, Orthodox Jews, who work in the area of Jewish-Christian relations, don't want to touch the topic of whether or not Christianity is considered by Judaism to be idolatry. Because there are, there are points of departure in our theology. That's obvious. We do not have the same theological faith system. We're not the same religion. We're not the same faith. Jews and Christians have points of, of disagreement. Now, those points of disagreement are not subtle. They're not minor issues. They're issues that relate to whether or not a person uh, is, is believing what they're supposed to believe. Now, for Christianity, that's very stark. Because according to Christian theology, if you don't have faith in Jesus, you're not saved. You're not going to heaven. There's no other way, right? Jesus is the only way. The only way to the Father is through the Son. That's Christian theology. Now, I as a Jew, I'm not offended by that. It's what Christians believe. It's, it's what they believe to be is, is the truth. That doesn't stand in the way of other aspects of the relationship, though. And the same is true on the Jewish side, meaning there is... the. the Obviously, I think anyone knows, every, everyone in the relationship knows that Jews reject any kind of faith in Jesus as a Messiah or, and certainly as a divinity of any kind. And therefore, that means that faith in Jesus is not kosher uh, from a, a Jewish perspective. But it's just not something we want to discuss because we don't want to emphasize the differences. Uh, but I think it's a very important topic to discuss because it's kind of one of those elephants in the room of the relationship, just for people to understand, uh, you know, to understand the terminology, to understand the categories, to understand the implications of various definitions. Meaning if a Christian says, yes, my Christian faith holds that you as a Jew, if you never do accept Jesus, you are not going to go to heaven and you will be, you, you, you know, then that does not stand in the way for me of the warmth of the relationship. It doesn't speak to any, it doesn't even speak to any other ulterior motive. It just happens to be the theological position that they hold. So you're willing to risk being offensive? Well, I, I don't think that, that we're going to be offensive. I think I'm going to explain the Jewish position. And like I said, anyone listening to this, everyone, everyone in our audience, any, any Jew or Christian listening to this knows that, that the theology that, that Christianity posits, the Trinitarian theology, the theology uh, that, that God incarnated himself in a human body in the person of Jesus, 
is not is is not acceptable according to Jewish theology. I don't think that's news to anybody. So there's no what reason you, for anyone to be offended. Acceptable? What do you there's mean no by not acceptable? Okay, so well, well, this gets into the heart of it. Maybe what we should do to start uh, is really okay. is really discuss what we mean by idolatry, um, because it's that itself is a bit of a complicated question. Okay, let's jump into the mud. Okay, <laughs> so so, uh, and I'll tell you the difficulty with this is when I speak to most people, what is idolatry? They picture. You know, this, you know, going into your, your, your back room and there's this little, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark golden thing. And you're going, oh, great, whatever, you know, here, take this piece of meat and get, get me the raise that I want for my boss. You know, that is how most people envision idolatry. Um, and that is certainly idolatry. There's no question about it. Uh, but how does what we call chazal, how do the sages of uh, Jewish law, how do they define idolatry? Well, uh, idolatry literally means worshiping a God other than the God of Israel, un other than Hashem, other than the God that we worship. That's the most basic definition of, of, uh, of idolatry. We use the word idolatry, which has the word idol in it. So that, sen that tends to lead us astray and lead to this kind of default thinking the way you just expressed it, that idolatry involves an idol. It doesn't necessarily involve an idol. Uh, let's use the Hebrew term. Um, we'll introduce our listeners to the Hebrew term, and we'll use that term for the rest of the conversation. The term is avodah zarah. Okay, let's, let's understand that term. That's the Jewish term that will generally be translated as idolatry, but it's not a very good translation. The Hebrew term is much uh, is is much more precise. Avodah zarah literally means foreign worship, meaning, but what we mean by foreign is worship. Avodah means worship. And the word zar or zara in this case, because it's a feminine word, avodah, the word worship is a feminine word. The word zara means strange or strange, not in the sense of strange, like weird, is, which is how we use it nowadays. Strange meaning other. It is not worship of God. It's worship of something that is czar. It is outside uh, of what's acceptable. Meaning it's worship of something other than God. That's what avodah zara literally means. Okay? And that is uh, forbidden. It's forbidden to worship a God other than God. That's, the, uh, that's right there at the beginning of the Ten Commandments. It's either the first or second commandment, depending on whether you count according to the Christian traditional count of the Ten Commandments or the Jewish. There's a there's a difference in how to count the first three commandments between Jews and Christians, but I think the I think the difference is actually quite immaterial. Um, but uh, so it's either the first or second commandment that one shall have no other gods before me. Right? There's there should be no. We're not allowed to worship. You know, not to bow down to them, not to worship them. That is, that's right there. It's one of the most uh, important cardinal commandments. We're not allowed to worship any other god. So, classical avodah zarah is literally worshiping other gods, Mesopotamian gods, Egyptian gods, Greek gods, whatever they may be, worshiping some other god other than God, worshiping Baal. You know, as we see throughout the throughout the Bible, that is classic avodah zarah. That's that's Avodah Zarah, worshiping a God that is not the God of Israel. Okay. Now, when we get to Christianity, we have a very interesting question. Okay. Uh, and the question becomes, is Christianity Avodah Zarah? Now, based on what I just told you, the question will really be, is a Christian, is someone who worships God in a Christian way, is that person worshiping a God other than the God of Israel? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, are we talking about the address they're praying to, or are we talking about the method they're using to arrive at that address? Okay, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Now, in terms of it, it, it depends what we're talking about here. Let me explain. If we're talking about the question of whether or not I have violated a biblical commandment 
of worship of a foreign god, and there are a number of specific foreign gods that are named in the five books of Moses, in the in the books of the Torah, that were forbidden from worshiping. There, for example, Molech is one of them. That's a pretty famous one. People like to talk about that. Um, so there, if, if the discussion is, have I violated the, the commandment of Avodah Zarah by doing a particular act or a particular form of worship, then we get into a whole other type of question, which is different gods had different specific modes of worship, that that was how they were worshipped. And unless you worship the God in the way that they are worshipped, or in a general way that all gods can be worshipped, like prayer or sacrifices, then mm -hmm. I have violated Avodah Zarah to the point that I will receive the death penalty for committing Avodah Zarah. If I, if I worship God A using a worship style that's meant for God B, and it's not appropriate for God A, so technically I, I might, that that's like a loophole, and I, I won't necessarily be be prosecuted for Avodah Zarah. But that's not really our question here. Okay. I, I also I want to point out before we go on that those more explicit and blatant forms of idolatry still exist in the world and in rather some insidious ways. I remember there was this big crisis in um, the ultra orthodox neighborhoods in Jerusalem. The women wore wigs, and then it was discovered that the wigs were made from hair of Indian women who cut off their hair, dedicating it to some pagan god. Um, there's, it's amazing. There's this incense that is, that is sanctified to the name of this idolatrous god. So that low form of blatant idolatry still does exist. But there are, even within Judaism, there's questions of how do you serve God in a way that is not idolatrous, in a way that doesn't necessarily include um, an idol, uh, an explicit idol. So, yeah. So I'm sorry, you were saying. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, but, but in terms of the topic that we want to get to, which is the question yeah. of Christianity, I don't want to get into like the various corners of planet Earth where people are still doing, you know, ancient okay. pagan yeah. type things or really hold idol truly, you know, 100% pure idolatrous beliefs. It's just important to understand what the basic definition of Avodah Zarah is that we're talking about. It's a God other than the God of Israel and the person is worshiping it. And that is pure Avodah Zarah, right? And then of course, on the other end of the spectrum, let's, if we set up a, a kind of binary on the other end of the spectrum, we have, we have the faith in the God of Israel, the, the, the religion of the people of Israel, their faith in their, in the one God. And we worship him in the way that he, instructs us to worship him in the Bible. And then along comes Christianity. Now, here is where things get complicated. It could be argued that Christians, um, because they believe like Jesus, they could reason that they are, in fact, serving the God of Israel. We're getting ahead of ourselves. I know. Let's build, <laughs> it's very characteristic. Adam, I apologize. Let, let's build things layer by layer, okay? Let's blame it on my ADD, okay? <laughs> Let's build things layer by layer, okay? Okay. So we, we understand now the definition of Avodah Zarah. Avodah Zarah is what we call idolatry. It is uh, belief in and worship of a God other than the God of Israel, okay? Okay. The, the problem that is presented by Christianity is that Christianity is a an in from a Jewish perspective? And again, this shouldn't be a surprise. No one should get offended by this. But from a Jewish perspective, it is a faith in something incorrect about the God of Israel. Right? Meaning, someone who is someone could someone who believes the Christian. Sorry, before you go on, could you repeat that? That is an incredibly important statement. Well, I'm just stating a historical fact. This isn't even uh, complex theology. No, it's not, but it's... it's Here's it's the complex. issue. Here's the issue. When I'm talking about someone who believes in, you know, Amun-Ra in Egypt or worships Baal, they're, they're simply worshiping an absolutely false god. It has nothing to do with the god of Israel. 
they don't have any kind of faith in in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't believe that that the God of of of, of the Bible created the world. Like it, it, meaning, they're worshiping other gods, right? That's pure avodazara. Along comes Christianity, and Christianity posits that the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Genesis through, you know, you know, through Malachi, that the God of Israel, the God who, who spoke to Moses and spoke to Ten Commandments, that God also incarnated himself in the person of Jesus, died for the sins of humanity, and that actually, and this isn't in the New Testament, but it comes along a little later, and it is almost universally held uh, by, by Christians. There are a few denominations that reject it, but they believe in the, in in the Trinitarian nature of the Godhead. And what that means is not just that the one God expresses himself in, in a number of different ways, which is how some people in a modern sense have interpreted it, but that's really not the Trinity. But a belief in the Trinity means that there are three separate persons that are also somehow one, and they're co-equal and co-eternal. And that and and that that is the God of Israel. So here's where things get a little bit complicated. So what does that mean? Does someone who has faith, from a Jewish perspective, now, okay, if I'm if I have faith in the God of Israel, let's say just let's forget about Christianity for a moment, just to simplify the uh, the thinking. I'm a Jew. I have faith in God. Faith in the God of Israel. Right? I believe in God. You believe in God. You know. I say my prayers. I believe everything in the Torah. But let's say there's something I believe about God that is incorrect. Let's say there's something I believe about God that's incorrect. Let's say I believe that he, that he has a physical body, for example. You believe he's eight feet, eight feet tall with a long white beard. Right. Let's say I believe that he, he, he exists in a physical space, okay, which is, a rejected, uh, which is rejected by Jewish faith. Am I an idolater? Well, I believe in the God of Israel. I believe something grossly inaccurate about him. Right? So how inaccurate can I be before we're forced to say that's not faith in the God of Israel anymore? Follow? Yeah. And that's where, and that's where Christianity becomes a complex issue for Judaism. Because so I can say I can say I believe in the God of Israel. Um, the God of Israel is eight feet tall, long white beard. So I'm kind of like on a scale of one to ten, I'm at like a five, you know, <laughs> as opposed to believing in Malach or you know the great serpent God who eats children. Um, that would be like a ten on a scale of one to ten. Ten being straight up idolatry. So right. we're talking about a sliding scale, and Christianity is not as you understand it, an extreme form of idolatry. Well, hold on. Hold on. Okay, we'll I'm get sorry. there. What my yeah, opinion is, <laughs> what my opinion is, yes, is a I'm separate issue. We'll get to that. Let's first walk through the, the, what the issue at hand is. When we, when we talk about this question of does Judaism consider Christianity idolatrous, okay? Let's understand what it is we're talking about here. There the, the main opinion within Judaism, the main authority that considers Christianity to be idolatry, is the opinion of Rabbi Moses Maimonides, usually known by the name Maimonides. Now, people didn't have last names in the 12th century. Maimonides means son of Maimon. He was the, his father's name was Maimon. His name was Moshe or Moses. And he's known usually in Jewish circles by the Hebrew acronym uh, Rambam, okay, and he is without question, and what I'm saying is not, it's not my opinion, it's basically the universal opinion of Judaism uh, for, for the last 800 years, Maimonides is the most authoritative and best known theologian and, and, uh, and Jewish legal authority. Now, that does not mean that we follow his legal opinions on everything. In fact, there's many, many things that we don't. But in the 12th century, he codified Jewish law. He summarized everything that came before him in the Talmud and the other and the sages for centuries before him. 
and he codified Jewish law, and he did it in such a systematic way. And he also codified Jewish theology. Uh, he was really the first person to, I mean, there were, there were others before him, uh, Rabbi Sajagon and, and others who also had some sort of systematized theology. But, but Maimonides' systematic theology was, was far beyond anything that came before him. And ever since him, even though, even though there are many, many areas of Jewish law where we don't, where the prevailing opinion that we follow today is not Maimonides' opinion, Maimonides' opinion always must be dealt with. It's always, it's always there as a major opinion that, 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 uh, that has impact. Now, Maimonides, his, his position theologically was that Christianity is absolutely idolatry. Okay? That was his position. His position is quite well known uh, because he's Maimonides and he's really the most well-known uh, Jewish theologian. And because the issue of whether or not Christianity is idolatry does not really have, or for almost all of our history until very recently, did not really have too many practical implications. I mean, there weren't Jews, you know, in Poland in the 1700s asking their rabbis questions about whether or not Christianity was idolatry because there was no, there was no, there was no Jewish Christian relations going on. Right. Okay, so they, it wasn't really they, a practical issue. It was kind of a, a, an abstraction. Yeah. Now, whenever there were questions, here's an interesting rule, Adam. Whenever there are questions in Jewish law or Jewish thought that don't have real life practical applications, what you'll find is very few authorities even grappling with the issues because these rabbis throughout the centuries weren't wasting their time by and large, they didn't grapple with issues that didn't have practical ramifications. Or if they grappled with them, they didn't come to any clear practical conclusions because they didn't need to. And because I, of example, that... I, I understand, for example, I spent a lot of years studying the laws of kosher. And keeping kosher is something you do every time you sit down to eat. And oh my gosh, they look at every little thing. Right, because it was all practical. practical. Because it's practical. It was all practical. But, so... So what would a practical implication of this question be? Well, a practical implication of this question would be, uh, for example, uh, is it permissible to go into a church because it's raining outside and you want to get some shelter from the rain? Okay, so mm -hmm. if Christianity is idolatry, it is forbidden to benefit, just like you were talking about that strange controversy about the wigs. The whole issue there wasn't that these women wearing wigs that were made by, you know, by uh, by Hindu women who, you know, ascribe some sanctity to their hair that they'll be worshiping. The issue was having benefit. There's a there's a prohibition in Jewish law from having benefit from from idolatry. So if Christianity is an idolatrous religion. If it's deemed idolatry, then that means that I'm that I as a Jew am not allowed to have any benefit whatsoever from a church building, and that benefit okay. could be like, for example, um, shielding myself from the elements. Okay, and that's just a, a simple example. There's many many implications of this. But these questions were not really well worked out through the centuries. Now, anytime you have a situation like that, there will be misconceptions in the minds of many, many people about what Jewish law actually says. Now, like on the issue of Christianity, Maimonides, like I said, ruled that Christianity was idolatrous. But the reason he ruled it was idolatrous, let's make it very clear. I mentioned a number of different aspects of Christianity, that God incarnated himself, that he died for the sins of humanity, uh, you know, that Jesus, w w as God, died for the sins of humanity, and I mentioned the Trinity. The issue that Maimonides has with Christianity that leads him to deem it to be idolatrous is the Trinity. He says that repeatedly. That's the issue. The idea that God, it, it, the, the compromise on the oneness of God was enough for Maimonides to rule it as idolatrous. Now, I want to point out, if I may, that uh, you, you mentioned that the Rambam was in the 12th century. Um that's well before the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. So the Rambam was specifically talking about Catholicism, if I'm not mistaken. Um, probably. He also had some exposure to the Copts 
And there were some other, you know, I don't know what exposure he had to any other denominations. He lived mostly in Muslim countries, but he did live in Egypt for a time. So he certainly saw the Coptic church. Um, mm. But uh, whether or not the Reformation would have impacted Maimonides' position is not a speculation I want to enter into. I don't okay. like answers to questions that are like, well, if, if he lived nowadays, he would say something different. I, I, I'd rather not go there. Because there's a much, much more, uh, uh, I think to understand this issue, and for our Christian listeners to really understand this issue, we need to, we need to hear the other side of the, of the, of the argument. Because Maimonides is not only not the only authority who weighed in on this topic, he's actually not the prevailing opinion, even though he's the most famous opinion. Oh. Most Jews on the street will cite Maimonides, oh, you know, Rambam says that Christianity is Avodah Zarah. But I little do they know you, that if you look in the sources, the, I get that all the time. Sure, you get it all the time. But if you look in the source, this is what I'm saying. If you look in the sources of later authorities, they all chose the opinion that was contemporary to Maimonides, the other scholars in Maimonides' time who weighed in. And it, it's probably significant that these other scholars did not live like Maimonides did most of his life in Muslim countries, but they actually lived among Christians. We're talking about mm. rabbis who lived in France, in Provence, in Germany. They lived among Christians in a similar time period. What's known, if we have any Jewish listeners, the Tosafists, the Balei Atosvot, the Me'iri, there were other rabbinic authorities, major rabbinic authorities, who said, no, Christianity is not idolatry. Okay, but what is it then? If Christianity is not idolatry, what is it? So there's another category bes between what is perfectly kosher Jewish theology and Avodah Zarah. There's actually another category. And the category is what's called in Hebrew shituf. The word shituf literally means um, combination. Okay? Or blending partnership at times it depends on how you use the word in the context right partnering yeah partnering or or sharing okay what it means in this context here's what she means she means that i believe in god the god of israel the god of the bible fully but i also believe in something else in addition to him or going back to the language I used earlier, I believe something about him that is fundamentally wrong. Okay? That's shituf. But fundamentally wrong to the point that it's like there's another, there's another force in the picture. That's shituf. God and something else. Most authorities, most Jewish authorities, and again, for our Jewish listeners and for your benefit, because uh, you know these sources, the Ramah, Rabbi, Rabbi, uh, uh, Moshe Israelis, uh, who is, you know, in terms of how we practice today, as authoritative as it gets, really. Um, he's, he's the one whenever you want to know how do we practically... How do, what do we actually do? Right, exactly. Today, so the Ramah, the Ramah is That's pretty clear that it, 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 he, this, is, this is his position. The position of most authorities, and if you look in modern th authorities writing in the 20th century, writing, writing now, I mean, now it's the 21st century already, but recent authorities... Uh, I think, for example, of, uh, of Rabbi Chaim David Halevi, who was the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv until he passed away a few years ago. Uh, a great scholar, wrote many volumes of responsa, and he says it quite clearly. He says, we don't follow the opinion of Maimonides. It's not the prevailing view. He's not the only one who says it. Many, many oh, really? recent scholars say that the prevailing view that we follow, that we hold to be the case, is that Christianity is shituf. Now, why is that significant? She too I'll also tell you why that's significant that. for me is because a lot of people will be saying they use the word Shituf and Avodah Zara interchangeably. As no, if absolutely not. So whoa, 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 whoa. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Right. So what? So the rule of Shituf, and here, here, I need everyone to kind of take a deep breath, take a sip of your drink, and I'm going to explain something, and it's a bit complicated. So track with me here, okay? Okay. Track with me here. Shituf is prohibited for 
Jews. But it is not prohibited for non-Jews. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Judaism is a funny religion, right? Judaism, unlike Christianity, unlike Islam, Judaism has no aspiration to make everyone into Jews, okay? Which is a strange thing. It sounds a little strange at first. Like, why? If you believe that Judaism is the truth, why don't you want everyone to be Jewish? Well, because Judaism does not, def does not define the ideal of all of humanity as the Jewish religion. Judaism defines itself as God defined us right before he gave us the Ten Commandments at Sinai. When we entered into the covenant, when the, when the nation of Israel entered into a covenant with God at Sinai, chapter 19, you know, chapter 20 is, is the Ten Commandments, so that's more famous. But chapter 19, the, the chapter right before the Ten Commandments, is actually theologically far more significant than chapter 20, than the Ten Commandments themselves. It's a lot, the whole dialogue between God and the nation of Israel through Moses and the explanation of what the covenant is, is very, very important. A lot that goes on there. But right there at the beginning of chapter 19, when God introduces and says to Moses, okay, we're about to enter into this covenant, you're going to become my people. God says, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, what does that mean? Mamlechet kohanim in Hebrew, a kingdom of priests. The word priest in Hebrew, kohen, does not only refer to the family of Aaron. Throughout the Bible, it's used even referring to pagan priests. It's a generic word that refers to someone who serves in a ministering role, in a role helping the flock draw closer to the deity, to God, helping them worship. That is the role of a Kohen, of a priest. Okay, And that's the role of Aaron and his family, the family of Kohanim, the, the family of priests. So when God calls the nation of Israel and says to us as a people that we will become a kingdom of priests, he doesn't mean that everyone's clergy. He doesn't mean that you're going to have an entire society where everyone is a priest. It makes no sense. What, he mean, what God meant clearly is that as the priests are to, to a nation, the nation of Israel is to the world. We have a priestly role to play. Now, priests, as we see in the Bible with the priests, you know, the, the Kohanim, the Levites, and within the Levites, the priestly family, which was one of the Levite families, they had rules that didn't apply to any other, anyone else in the nation of Israel. They had things that they could eat that no one else could eat. They had things that other, there were leniencies that applied to other people that they, that they were restricted from. They had special restrictions on who they could marry. There are places that they could go that no one else could go. There was a, they had a, a lot of different rules, more restrictive rules, to re, because of their more elevated status of holiness, in order to facilitate them doing their priestly role. By the same token, and this is how Judaism defines itself. This is just we have to understand this to understand the Avodah Zarah issue. The way Judaism defines itself is that we are the priestly people. And that's why our goal isn't to make the whole world into Jews. Our goal is to fulfill God's mission that he gave us, which is to bring knowledge of God to all the families of the earth. But what does that knowledge of God mean? Can people just know God and go on living their lives in the same pagan way they were living them in ancient Mesopotamia? No. That knowledge of God must bring with it also a certain set of values, of God's values. Does that mean all the laws in the Torah? No, the laws in the Torah are the laws for the priestly class, for the nation of Israel who have this special role. Okay? What we call them is both. But what the, what the nations of the world, what we demand of the nations of the world is certain basic morality, now, basic laws. They're often called the seven Noahide laws, although it, must be, it has to be made clear. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, here are the seven Noahide laws. It's not like God gave the seven Noahide laws. When, when Noah came out of the ark after the flood, there's this covenant that God enters into with Noah, and he, and he commands him certain things. Um, and, those, and the things he commands him have to do with basic morality. Um, and 
there's a few things that aren't indicated in there that were also assumed to be part of the seven Noahide laws by, by the Jewish sages. And the rabbis derived that there are basically seven laws. But whether or not it's seven or ten or two, or, or, or whether they're laws or not, the point is, what the seven Noahide laws embody is the goal of, of the people of Israel for the world. Because if you read through the Bible, forget about the, so, the, the, about the Noahide laws for a second. You read through the Bible and you see places where the prophets are telling the nation of Israel that their ultimate purpose is to bring all the families of the earth to know God. It's really about knowledge of God and, and shared worship of God. You think about those prophecies in Isaiah, those prophecies in Zechariah about the nations coming to Jerusalem and worshiping God together. It doesn't mean that they're keeping all the kosher laws. It doesn't mean that they're, that they're doing all the minutia of Jewish law, keeping all the 613 commandments. But it means that we want the nations of the world to, to have faith in and worship the one God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the basic uh, code of, of, of ethics and morality that go along with that. And what that means is that it, we, according to Jewish law, okay, here we go. According to Jewish law, the nations of the world are required to have faith in God, to not blaspheme him, meaning to not worship idols, to not worship other gods besides him, to not murder, to not commit adultery, and a number of other laws. It's seven laws. Okay. So one of the laws in the seven Noahide laws is that we want the nations of the world to have faith in God and they're not allowed to commit idolatry. Great. The Jewish people are also commanded not to commit idolatry. Here's where things get complicated. Okay? Right. Here's where they're about to get complicated. You, you, you the standard... The I'm looking down and I know. Yeah, here we okay. go. The standard that of our... Of our minimal uh, requirement, when we look at the nations of the world and say, okay, are we, how close are we to the ultimate vision of all the nations of the world having faith in God? Okay, who has faith in God? Who doesn't have faith in God? How do I determine whether or not someone in the, among the nations of the world has faith in God or a, or a particular belief system among the nations of the world qualifies under the seven Noahide laws as not being idolatrous and being considered faith in the God of Israel? How do I know? Does it mean that everyone among the nations of the world has to have a perfectly refined Jewish theology? No. No. For the baseline, for the baseline fulfillment of where we want the nations of the world to be, when we talk about bringing the whole world to knowledge of God, that knowledge of God will cover the earth like water covers the sea, the, what we're looking for is faith in the God of Israel. If if for the nations of the world, they also believe some other things about God, about the God of Israel, that happen to be according to the standard of our relationship to God, not things that we believe, but they still have faith in the God of Israel, that's okay. In other words, shituf is permissible for non-Jews, but it's not permissible for Jews. That doesn't mean that that we that it, we're in some sort of quantum reality where where there's where there's one god for us and one god for them what it means is that the level of of uh, of 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 refinement of the monotheistic faith in god that is required of a jew in the same way that we have dietary laws that that we don't expect someone because, of the nations of the world because to be because of bound our role by. as a, as a priestly nation the priestly nation and it only stands to reason. This shouldn't come as such a shock. Again, I'm not trying. I want to be very clear, Adam. I want to be very respectful of our audience. If you're Christian and you're watching this, I'm not trying to convince you to change your theology. I'm trying to let you know how we think about this issue. Okay? Because as I said at the beginning, if we want to look for aspects of of our respective theologies that uh, that come out making the other look bad. Christianity does not look too kindly on on uh, on on Jews like myself and Adam who who don't accept Jesus, but that's fine. That's all part of what we believe. It's okay to believe different things, but from the Jewish perspective, Judaism has no problem with Christians being Christian, so long as we don't hold like Maimonides, which we don't, because a Christian has faith in the God of Israel, in the form of shituf. Shituf is permissible for a a 
someone who's not a member of the nation of Israel, who's not part of the kingdom of priests, those who are part of the kingdom of priests who have this 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 cov this different covenantal relationship because we're members of the people of Israel, there's a certain there's a certain more specific theology of God that we're held to, a standard that we're held to that is not expected of everyone else. It's okay if if people who are not members of the nation of Israel have something else mixed into their faith in the God of Israel that isn't kosher from a Jewish perspective. What that means practically is that if I ask, if you ask me again, is Christianity avodah zarah, here's the, here's the complex answer. It is for a Jew, but it is not for someone who is not Jewish. Meaning, a Jew is forbidden from, from shituf, and therefore he's forbidden from having faith in and worshiping this Trinitarian, uh, even, this even Trinitarian Trinity, version of the God of Israel. Okay. But if you ask me, do Christians have faith in the God of Israel? Are th is their faith a faith that when we look at it from our perspective, from the perspective of our mission to bring all the nations of the world to faith in the God of Israel, are they there? The question, the answer is yes, they are. So it is not Avodah Zarah for them. So one of the implications of the Noahide laws, which is, if I understood correctly, is you're not permitted to live in the land of Israel unless you observe the seven Noahide laws. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's true for Jews and for Christians. Correct. For, for a Jew to live in the land of Israel, he may not do Avodah Zarah. So if I understood you correctly... If a Jew is guilty of shituf, he may not live in the land of Israel. But a Christian, in his Christian belief of the God of Israel, even with the Trinity, um, or without the Trinity, he would be permitted to live in the land of Israel. Is that accurate? Adam, it, it, it's accurate and it shouldn't be so shocking. Let me give you another example. Um, if, I, I know if, that there will be people who will no, be shocked. Well, think about it. If, if a Jew, if it, <coughs> if a Jew violates the Sabbath, uh, according to Torah law, he's liable for for a, for a very severe penalty. A Christian is not obligated in keeping of the Sabbath. He can if he wants to voluntarily. But if a Christian does the same thing, like let's say I light up a cigarette, I don't smoke. Let's say I light up a cigarette on the Sabbath, okay? You, the Bible says, the Torah says explicitly that I'm not, we're not allowed to burn any fire on the Sabbath day. Now do, right? So if I, if I light up a cigarette on the Sabbath, I have violated the Sabbath. I've committed a terrible sin. I'm not in good standing with God. I, there, you know, if I did it uh, by mistake, then there's a sin offering I have to bring. If I did it on purpose and there were witnesses, it's, you know, according to the Bible, it's a, it's a capital offense, Right. But if a Christian, a devout Christian who loves God, loves the God of Israel, if lights a cigarette on the Sabbath day, has he violated anything? No. 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 So uh, if he eats, if he eats non-kosher food, if, if he cooks milk and meat together, has he violated anything? No. Because that's not a law that applies to him. So By the same token, if, if a member of the family of Aaron comes into uh, on, uh, purposefully comes into contact with a corpse they have violated the laws of their of the pri the priestly laws that apply to them but i who am not a kohen i'm not a priest i'm allowed to meaning the bible god's law recognizes different categories of people who have different roles to play this is how judaism this is fundamental to how judaism sees itself and its relationship to the rest of the world, but also its internal relationship between the various tribes. We have different roles to play, and that means that different rules could apply to us. Um, and that's and it just so happens that this particular uh, rule, the rule of shituf, has a great impact on how we view Christianity. So, 
again, the bottom line is that from a Jewish perspective, Christianity is forbidden for a Jew, but is absolutely uh, a kosher form of faith for those who are not Jewish. And it, Unless it, one follows the opinions of Maimonides, which, as I said, most authorities today say that that is just not an opinion we follow any, you know, it's just not, it's just not how we rule. Meaning in terms of practical questions that come up or that rabbis get asked, they, they do not, they generally do not rule according to the opinion of Maimonides. So Rabbi Walicki, you very graciously walked us through what is a hugely complex, hugely controversial and rarely discussed subject. I want to point out that you're, you're, you walked us from Maimonides in the 12th century to the contemporary uh, halachic uh, Jewish legal opinions. Um, Jewish law is a process, a dialectic, a dialogue. Um, so there is definitely much more to be said about that. The, the, but there's something I need to add in before we go. We can't leave the discussion sure. without sure. adding something in. The very same Maimonides, I want to point this out, is very important. Because when, when, when Christians hear that there's Jewish sources or Jewish opinions, that Christianity is idolatrous, it sounds like this is terribly insulting thing. I want you to understand something. The very same Maimonides, who uncompromisingly said that Christianity is a false god, it is idolatrous, that very same Moses Maimonides wrote in the Laws of Sacrifices, Okay, so his his code of law covers everything. It covers laws that were only done in temple times. It covers everything. And in the laws of sacrifices, when he's talking about uh, different categories of people and which sacrifices they can bring, you know, men, women, he also mentions people who are not Jewish who can bring sacrifices in the temple. And he says that someone who's not Jewish who wants to offer a sacrifice to worship the God of Israel in the temple in Jerusalem can do so, and he, this is his words, even if he is an idolater. He uses the term of Oved Avodazar? Exactly. Really? Even if he is an idolater. Okay? In other words, the, the, the technical issue, even for him, the technical issue of whether or not something is deemed idolatrous has to do with, with the theological construct. The Trinity is not kosher from a Jewish perspective. From, from Maimonides, in Maimonides' theological view, any deviation from the pure abstract oneness of God is, is, is basically idolatry and heresy. And there's, you know, even within Jewish thinking, forget about Christianity, if someone b believes that God has a physical form up there in heaven. Maimonides also deems that person to be a complete heretic. That that's not that's not faith in God, according to Maimonides. Even though we would say, no, it's faith in God, but it's it includes something incorrect. It, it, but it, it, that's not even considered shituf necessarily. There's other there's other contemporaries of Maimonides who, on the spot, disagreed with him. And right there in his writings, there are glosses on the page where where they say, wait a second, why, why is he digging in so hard? So Maimonides. Maimonides was very strict about the theological definition of what is God and what is not God. And therefore, he looked at Christianity and says, not God. But that doesn't mean that Christians are not welcome to worship in the temple with us. I'll go even further. Maimonides was asked, because, you know, rabbis throughout the centuries, besides their commentaries and, and books of theology and such and, and legal writings, they also were asked questions frequently. These people led communities. And one of the most wonderful treasures that we have in the Jewish library is thousands of volumes throughout, from throughout the centuries of responsa, of questions and answers that were asked, real life questions that were asked to rabbis throughout the centuries. And Maimonides, in the responsa of Maimonides, which is less known, it's less well known than his other writings, but there's a responsum in there where someone asked him if it's permissible to study Torah with Christians. That was the question. It's as practical a question as we get nowadays, Adam, because you and I are both people who study Torah with Christians. Yes, and Maimonides gives a remarkable been, answer. Now, everyone, again, everyone in the Jewish world knows that Maimonides ruled that Christianity was idolatrous. Maimonides also incidentally ruled 
that Islam was not idolatrous. And his reason was that Islam believes in one God that is, has no physical form and is the creator of the world. And therefore, as far as he's concerned, it's not a compromise on the oneness of God. It's not the com compromise on corporeality. Those were his issues. And therefore, he ruled that it was not idolatrous. And there are those who disagree with him on that. Let's not get into that now. But my, but my point is the, is the responsum. Here's what Maimonides wrote in this responsum. He wrote that it is permissible and even a positive thing to study Torah with Christians, but it's forbidden to study Torah with Muslims. Even though Muslim, Islam is clearly not. Right. In other Torah. words, Islam is, Islam is not idolatrous. Christianity is. That's ruling number one. Ruling number two, when asked if you could study Torah with those who are not Jewish, he says explicitly, yes, if you want to study Torah with Christians, but no, if you want to study Torah with Muslims. And his reasoning, and then he lays out his reasoning. And his reasoning is that because Muslims do not believe in the same Bible as we do, they do not believe in the divinity of the text of the Tanakh, Therefore, if we teach them anything that is different from what they believe, it's not going to be a different perspective on something that they also hold to be true and dear. They'll just reject it outright because they reject our text altogether. They view our Bible as a forgery and as false. But he says, because Christians believe in the divinity of the scriptures, the same scriptures that we hold to be the word of God, they hold to be the word of God. Therefore, there's only to be gained by sharing our perspectives and his language. You know, it's interesting. There's different versions of his of his writings that have been published. But nowadays, with all the modern scholarship, we can have we actually can have uh, original, um, you know, the original text based on the on the manuscript. He wrote this response in Arabic and most of the uh, most of what's out there is translations into Hebrew. And there's one, there's one academic edition that has the Arabic side by side with a direct Hebrew translation from what he actually wrote. And I want to read to you the, the end edition? of the responsum. Listen to what he says at the end here. He says, and this is where he, he, he says that, it's, that it's, uh, it's perfectly fine to study Torah and even a good thing with Christians. And I'm going to translate it uh, word by word. Should I say it in Hebrew as I translate too, Adam? Would you like that? I actually would personally. You can okay, personal here we word. go. Aval ha notsrim ma'aminim benusach ha-Torah. But Christians believe in the text of the Torah. Shelo nishtana. They don't believe it has any change. Verak megalim ba-panim beferusham ha-mufsad. They only, but they have their own interpretations that are incorrect. Umafarshim zot beferushim. Shehem yiduim bahem. And they have their own explanations of these things. And if we, uh, if we set them right with the correct explanation of the biblical text, if perhaps they'll retract and they'll return to our way of seeing it. But even if they don't, when we want them to, Lo yavo lanu mizeh michshol. There's no stumbling block here. Velo yimtzau b'ktuvehem davar shonem miktuvotenu. And there's nothing in the Tanakh, in their version of the Tanakh, that is different from ours. Now, there's a phrase in there, when we want them to, which in the other editions of this, in the other publications of this responsum that sort of popped up through the centuries, is left out. But when people recently went back to the original Arabic manuscript, they found that phrase in there. Now, what's so significant about that phrase? Maimonides says there that, hey, it's a good thing to teach Torah to Christians because, look, they have the same text as us. If I share an insight from a Bible verse with a Christian and it's different than what they've heard before, maybe they'll like it and agree with it. Maybe they won't. This is what Maimonides says. Maybe they'll accept it. Maybe they won't accept it. And then he says, even if they don't accept it when we want them to, it's no problem. We're not causing any harm. They have, they have the same belief in the, in the divinity of the scripture as we do. 
the Divine Ron origin Bond of this who holds that uh, Christianity now what is it, is a what does he mean by that phrase when we want them to and I think here we have to appreciate Maimonides' full view of Christianity what Maimonides believed again the same Maimonides who says that Christianity is idolatrous and I, mm -hmm. I, I implore you to understand Think of that as a kind of technical issue with him. It's a technical issue because of the Trinitarian nature of the Godhead. For Maimonides, that's not God. However, they believe in the same Bible as us. And therefore, we can study together. We're both, we both see the scriptures the same way. So let's study them together. And maybe we'll convince them of our way of seeing it. Maybe we won't. But ultimately, down the road, we are going to see things the same way. And Maimonides, this is not the only place that he shares this view, that Christianity is actually a positive force in the world. The same Maimonides who rules it to be idolatry says explicitly that it's a positive force in the world that is leading the whole world to worship the God of Israel, ultimately. He says that. So I, I, I ask our Christian uh, listeners to, if you ever hear Jews saying that Christianity is idolatrous, understand that there's, there's a language and a culture of the technicalities of Jewish law, which doesn't, it, it, it's not an epithet. And, and we can have a wonderful relationship connecting with the God of Israel around, around the scriptures and around the shared points of our faith that, that there are, while at the same time realizing that there's points of our theology that are points of departure where, we, where if we reach that point, we look at each other and say, okay, that's not kosher for me. You know, and, you know, Chris, like I said at the beginning, Christians have the same thing with us. You know, we can share all kinds of things, but there are there are points of, in what we believe that, uh, you know, that are that that are points of departure. Amazing. OK, Rob Wilicki, I think uh, we're we've pushed the patience of our. <laughs> OK, I'm sorry. As far as it can time go. is up. We should um, do this again. Before we go, I want to I want to give I have a, a, a less than ideal habit of giving the disclaimers at the end of the videos. <laughs> um, the quick disclaimer is we don't believe in um, Judaism uh, prescribes um, proselytizing. We're not allowed to proselytize and attempt to convert people of other religions. Um, and as Torah observant Jews, we don't. Um, but we do believe in, as you put, as you said, the Rambam says, we believe in that connection um, on in the Bible, in the common Bible. Um, at the same time, we also do not mean to denigrate or to say that um, Christianity is, God forbid, a, a, a bad thing. Um, it's idolatrous and horrible. Um, uh, the Rabbah, we're saying the more so the opposite. We're saying that there that there is a positive thing there, but for us to have that connection, it has to be done uh, from a point of, of truth and uh, recognition. And uh, at least for us as, as Torah observant Jews, we are um, guided um, and strictly guided by, by Torah law. And that's what we were presenting today it was, uh, it was a Torah law position, which unfortunately is not universally known by all Jews. Uh, right. Some Jews are, unfortunately, they can take good things and uh, use their hateful motives to to say hateful things, and we also. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's and, listen. I, most Jews are not are not well are not so well versed in the in these minutia, exactly. so they just yeah. kind of know the headline. The headline, oh, Maimonides says it's idolatry. They don't they don't right. really know they don't really know the practicals. Right. Um, right. I, I, let me just add, if any of your listeners want to uh, follow me or or uh, you know hear more of uh, of what I have to say about things, I I do a weekly podcast. Uh, together with a pastor from upstate New York. We record it once a week and we interview, most of the time we interview uh, people and we talk about all kinds of issues that are important to people of faith. And it's called- I'll be putting shoulder. the link in the video, uh, below the well, video. Well, thank you. So it's you called can... Shoulder to Shoulder. You can find it on all podcast platforms. You can also find, you can also find it at the website of Israel365news.com. And the Rambam would be proud of you. Oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. This is a huge issue. Hopefully uh, we'll be investigating it more. There is an awful lot to be said from about this um, from, from all angles, from the Jewish angle, from the Christian angle, from the in-between angle. Um, and we intend to do that. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm, ha bless I'm happy to continue that. the conversation. Amen. <laughs> thank you so much, Rob Fessa. God bless.